Breaking news tonight, a GLAM PhD student, 29, volunteers to babysit. Ends up, she tortures her dear friend's twin baby boy dead, according to reports. And now, she's shocked. She may be punished. That's right. In that jurisdiction on death row, there are no women, much less a glamorous young Ph.D. student. Good evening. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us. A Pittsburgh family with newborn twin babies asks a longtime friend to babysit. Matters take a turn for the worse. I know how difficult it is to have twins, to give birth to twins, to keep them alive. The, these two twin baby boys had been yearned for, sought after for so long. And now, Mommy and Daddy, amazingly, this occurred on Daddy's first Father's Day and Mommy's and Daddy's anniversary. What exactly happened? How did it all start? Listen. Calling 911 around 11.15 p.m., Nicole Verzi tells the dispatcher that Leon has fallen from a bassinet and bumped his head and is becoming unresponsive. When police arrive, Verzi tells police she falls asleep with the baby in his bouncer seat. When she wakes up, she goes to get a bottle from the kitchen for the baby. While she is out of the room, she hears Leon screaming and finds him on the floor with a bump on his head. She tells police he fell out of his bouncer seat. Fell out of a bouncer seat. You know, the bouncy kind that you have the baby um, with a, a seat belt buckled in. With me, an all-star panel to make sense of what we know right now. But first, straight out to Gabriella DeLuca. Investigative news reporter on television, WPXI. Gabriella, thank you for being with us. A couple of quick questions, then I'm going to move forward. The bouncy seat, it's my understanding it was 18 inches off the ground. That little bouncy seat, that one, is that correct, 18 inches? Detectives came in and actually measured the top of that seat to the bottom and it came out to 18 inches. But keep in mind, when Verzi first called 911, she actually said that it was a bassinet. So we have a bouncy seat. You're bassinet. right on Which again, Gabriella DeLuca. I was just headed toward the possibility that a child could bounce out like a trampoline of a bouncy seat. And I had both of my twins had bouncy seats. They had the swings. They had the bouncy seats. They had it all. And they come with seat belts. That said, 18 inches. And I didn't know where that 18 inch number came from. And you just enlightened me. I'm going to get to the conflicting stories in a moment. And you know how I feel when people change their stories, not add to their story. That's fine. Changing your story, not so much. But the 18 inches, uh, no. How can you have this? Massive degree of brain injury from falling this far, this far. That's not going to happen. Uh, okay, so that's where we leave off. Let's take a look at the ride to the hospital. Listen. Rushed to the hospital, doctors discover Leon Katz has a severe skull fracture to the left side of his head and multiple brain bleeds. The injury suffered by the six-week-old baby proved fatal, and he's pronounced dead the next morning at Children's Hospital. Police say Versi has no plausible explanation for the severity of Leon's injuries. Examining the bouncer seat, detectives report that it's about 18 inches from the tallest point of the seat to the floor. That's right. Gabriella DeLuca from WPXI told us that. And I guarantee you those measurements are correct in a situation like this. Joining me in All-Star Panel, in addition to Gabriella DeLuca, WPXI, I want to go straight to a longtime colleague, now friend, the esteemed chief medical examiner of Tarrant County, that's Fort Worth, and I can guarantee you this, never a lack of business for the medical examiner in Dallas-Fort Worth area. Also, a lecturer at the Burnett School of Medicine at TCU, Dr. Kendall Crowns joining us. Dr. Crowns, 
Thank you for taking time out of your schedule and addressing this issue. Many of us have heard of CHI, closed head injuries. I coined um, CHHI, closed head homicidal injuries, closed head injuries that end in homicide charges. But before I get to that an acronym, I want to talk to you about the possibility uh, of the severity of baby Leon. Oh, by the way, I'm going to circle back to Gabriella DeLuca because the other baby is also injured. This couple has two children, like me, two twins, like me. They're infants. One is rushed to the hospital and the other has severe injuries to its Okay, I did. this woman steps in the apartment, everything's fine, and in five hours, everything's gone haywire. Wow, what's the common denominator there? Her. Her. The babysitter. The glam, as many people call her, not me, them. The glamorous PhD student. Dr. Kendall Crowns. The likelihood of baby Leon's injuries to be that severe from one fall from an 18-inch bouncy seat. Uh, closed head injuries from 18-inch fall is highly unlikely. If a child was to get closed head injuries from a fall of that nature, then when they're learning how to walk and they'd fall, we'd have a lot more children having closed head injuries. So another thing you have to think about is a baby's skull is kind of pliable because they're still growing and it hasn't turned to full bone yet. So really an 18 inch fall could have startled the child, could have made him cry, but it shouldn't have caused any injuries internally whatsoever. Uh, when you're seeing that, it's slow down, usually there's- Slow down, slow down, slow down. Dr. Kendall Crowns, I can see I'm gonna have to work with you before I put you on the stand because everything you said is so um, probative for me, every sentence, and I don't wanna rush it. I'm usually uh, 90 MPH. But when you talk, I need to dissect every sentence. Now, you mentioned something about a baby of this age, head not being fully formed. What does that mean, number one? And number two, what does it help me prove, if anything? That's really all I care about when it comes to facts. Can I use it in court? Is it probative? Does it prove anything? So a baby's skull at that age still has what are called fontanelles or soft spots and they're kind of at the top of the head a little bit towards the back and that's so the baby's is head that where the baby hair swirl is it can you be you know how the hair starts in a little swirl back here you call uh -huh. that a fontanel okay. fontanel okay. yeah so as the child's head uh, as the child matures their brain gets bigger the uh, skull itself grows with it and the skull at this time period isn't fully hardened bone. It's bone, but it's still kind of very pliable. So it can take a lot of changes. Is it like cartilage? Changes. Somewhat, somewhat like cartilage, but it's not cartilage. It's just very young bone. But anyway, it's very pliable. Well, does it have the it, elasticity of cartilage, like the cartilage in your nose or your ear? Is it, I mean, I yes. know it's bone, but is it, mm, elastic or pliable or movable yes. like the cartilage when you in your ear yes baby skulls are very bendable they can take a lot of change in shape or deformation and they won't break so when you see a skull fracture or a close hit injury with a baby there's a lot of force behind it it isn't going to be from an 18 inch fall because if it was all of us would have died from head injury as babies because we all have falls so when you see an injury like that, you know that there's a, some sort of slamming force or something like that that has occurred. Do you, you, you said it's practically impossible for baby Leon, and, and remember, um, he's just six weeks old. He's the one with the severe skull fracture to the left side of his head with multiple brain bleeds. Ari is the twin with a bloody, mysterious injury to j swollen, bruises below the belly button, and scratches on his face. I'll get to that in a moment. But these two little boys, you're saying it's almost impossible, or is it 
impossible for a child six weeks old, can't crawl, to fling, eject himself from a car seat, from a, a baby bouncer, 18 inches in height, and die, to put it simply. Unless there was some sort of congenital abnormality or birth defect, yes, it's impossible for that to have occurred. Okay, we already know that none of that existed. So it's impossible I'm trying to for get it a to definitive. Have Look, I'm a JD, not a DDS. Don't know how to pull teeth. But I do have a set of pliers here. So are you saying it would be impossible? For him to have ejected and have enough force or velocity or speed to hit the ground and break his skull and get hemorrhage of his brain, and he's completely normal, yes, that would be impossible. Right now, so many thoughts are colliding in my head, and I'm so grateful for you, Dr. Kendall Crowns, because I'm thinking about the little baby brother growing up his whole life, knowing he had a twin that was killed, the parents, this happening on the first Father's Day and their anniversary, and from then on out on that day, how can they celebrate baby Ari's birthday on the day that Leon was killed? How can they celebrate their anniversary on that day? I mean, you know, I'm projecting a lot, uh, Dr. Kendall Crowns, but I know on August the 6th, the day that my fiance was murdered, I don't know, this is crazy, right? And I'm not superstitious at all. But I feel like whatever I do that day is just going to be jinxed and wrong. I don't like my twins driving. I don't want to take a trip. Just, I can't really describe it. It doesn't make sense. But I'm gl glad I've got you and the rest of our guests to keep me grounded in these facts and not project. So, back to the injuries. Listen. Doctors tell investigators about the injuries suffered by Leon's twin brother, Ari. He has small scratches on both sides of his face, two bruises below his belly button, and swelling, bruising, redness, and scratches to his <laughs> The doctor who examined the injuries to both boys says they are consistent with having been sustained as a result of child abuse, as these were inflicted injuries that are not natural and not accidental, noting that all of Leon's injuries were acute. Acute. Gabriella DeLuca has all the facts leading up to this moment, but I want to quickly address closed head homicidal injuries. Um, I want to go straight out to Dr. Melissa Merrick, President and CEO of Prevent Child Abuse America, and you can find her at preventchildabuse.org. Okay, Dr. Merrick, thank you for being with us. Many people are suspicious of closed head injuries, especially closed head injuries that result in death and subsequent homicide charges. Um, you look at the baby, and the baby seems fine because it's closed head. The head is not split open. Explain this. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it can be, you know, we think about child abuse and we think that there will always be a, bro a, a bruise or a broken bone or something that we can see and we know that there was harm. But actually, especially in babies this young, under the age of one, that's the time that's riskiest for, for child abuse, the most prevalent and most of our child abuse deaths happen under the age of one. And that's because, as you said, that some of the injuries you don't see. So like shaken baby syndrome, for example, that's a serious brain injury resulting from forcefully shaking an infant. And like Dr. Crowns already explained, you know, the baby's brain is pliable and still working out and you shake all that up and brain cells can die. There can be permanent damage and even death. Never, ever shake a baby because we may not see it, but it can really uh, cause uh, tremendous harm. Exactly. Now, Kelly Hyman joining us, a renowned trial lawyer and TV legal analyst. She's the host of Once Upon a Crime in Hollywood. That's a podcast. Kelly, thank you for being with us. Everything Melissa just said, Dr. Merrick said is correct. This is not a shaken baby syndrome incident. 
uh, but everything she said was correct. Is it difficult to prove a case when a jury looks at a baby's picture and it doesn't look like anything's wrong with the baby? All the damage is internal. Experts are going to be key in this case, Nancy. So the experts are going to take the witness stand and tell a story and tell exactly what happened and what transpired. Now, the defendant is innocent until proven guilty, and they will have a time to cross-examine that person and poke holes in that. But that, that is going to be key in order to substantiate the case because the state brings the case, the Commonwealth, and they have the burden of proof and need to prove every single element of the crime. And the experts are going to be key taking the stand and telling uh, what happened from their perspective. Savannah and Ethan Katz entrust longtime friend Nicole Veerzy to care for newborn twins. Then Veerzy calls to inform them of strange injuries found on one of the babies. That was just the beginning. I I've got to understand the timeline here. Let me go to Gabriella DeLuca, investigative TV news reporter, WPXI. Gabriella, thank you for being with us. Let me understand this. When you first read a headline about this, it always says babysitter. But she wasn't really the babysitter. She was a very dear family friend going back several years. And on her break from school where she was getting her psych degree, psychology degree, she got a break, I guess spring break, and chose to use that break to visit the cat's family. Now, she is in school, and she teaches spin classes, correct? The bicycle spin classes, right? That's what she does. So That's she, what we understand, yes. Well, I think I've got a photo of her with her spin class. Let's see if we can dig that up, Liz. Um, Gabriella, oh, yes, there she is. There we go. That's her with her spin class, I believe. Gabriella, so she comes to visit. She rents an Airbnb just a few blocks away from the cat's family and goes over to visit. And the next thing you know, all H-E-L-L -L breaks loose. She hasn't been in that house over an hour before, let me just say, it hits the fan. Give me the timeline, Gabriella DeLuca. So here's what we understand. Investigators are saying that she came into town and from what we are gathering, she came to almost have a celebration. Again, it was Father's Day, it was the anniversary, and you have these beautiful twin baby boys. Well, um, you know, I have twins myself. You know how tired, and Nancy, so do you. So you know how tired you get. We kind of get the idea that she's there to help out. So the mother, I believe, goes down for a nap, according to police. So it's the father and this woman who are taking care of the babies that day. I understand that she is, according to police, changing the baby's diaper, Ari's diaper, in the hallway. Okay, wait a minute. Of their Did you rooms. say mommy's taking a nap? Yes, mom, according to police, was taking a nap. Oh, gosh. And, you know, I didn't know you were the mom of two twins. That's a luxury. That's unbelievable that in the middle of the day you get to close your eyes for 45 minutes together <laughs> so the mom's taking a nap and then the next thing you know what happens so what we understand from police is that Nicole is changing the baby's diaper and then notices these injuries to the baby. We're talking scratches, bruises below the belly button, and then some sort of injury to the baby's She apparently tells, according to police, the father of the baby about these injuries. And that's okay, what the whoa, father whoa, 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 right, right there. Go ahead. That is probative. That proves something to me, Gabriella DeLuca. She's the one that tells the father because, see, a lot of people will say, oh, well, the father was with the baby. No, the father was not with the baby. Nicole Versey was with the baby. I'm talking about baby Ari, the baby that lived, and she runs and tells the dad, I'm with the baby, and I found this injury to his <laughs> Now, hold on. Injury scratches, bruising, swelling on face. That's what police are saying. And she tells the dad this. 
And then the dad apparently, you know, as a parent, calls the doctor's office, calls the pediatrician. And, you know, he's on the hotline. You know how it is. You can't get through. You're waiting on the hotline. What do I do? What do I do? And he, uh, the guidance is to take the baby to the hospital. You know, that's kind of what they always say. Thank goodness. Um, I want to focus on one other one, well, I'm going down uh, a rabbit hole here. Dr. John Delatore joining me, licensed psychologist and mediator, specializing in forensic psychology. And you can find him at resolutionfcs.com. Dr. Delatore, as I understand the facts, she volunteered to go change the diapy. Gabriella, is that true? She said she changed the diapy? Yes. Okay. So, Dr. Delatore, have you ever seen those people that create a problem and then they fix it and then they're the hero? Okay. Oh, sure. They yeah, place the themselves. Yeah. They place themselves at the location of the incident, be it a crime or not a crime. She volunteers to go change the diapy. And then she says, oh, his is swollen. There's He's got scratches on his face. None of that was apparent when she arrived. No, you think mommy's going to go take a nap with the baby swollen and and scratches all over him? No, no. The dad, no. They go in, they see the babies, and it's then mom says, okay, I'm going to take a nap. The baby was fine. No scratches on the face. This happened after she volunteers to change the diaper. I know that's a small fact, a subtle but very critical fact in this scenario and timeline. Yeah, Nancy, what you're describing is, is what's called factitious disorder by proxy. It used to be called uh, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And I think that's the key element here because sure, you could probably hide the, the injuries that are happening underneath the but you can't really hide the scratches to the face. And that's the, that's the element that I think you're really harping on, uh, as well as I would be sort of wanting to investigate further, which is, well, if he had all of these scratches, how come no one, no one indicated that these scratches were just there and, or could give a plausible reason as to why the baby would have scratches? So anything else could be hidden, and you're absolutely right. Could they have been caused by her? Sure, they could have. Could any number of other reasons or other things have been happening? Those could have happened as well. But why wasn't anyone actually told? Why would any of this be a shock? And I think that's the element that we need to, to, to really investigate further. Now, interesting, Dr. John Delatore, <clears throat> I believe you said I was harping on a fact. I don't know that being compared to a harpy is exactly uh, what I was going for. I'm pointing out the fact, which I find extremely probative, agree or disagree, Kelly Hyman, that she, Nicole Verzi, places herself alone, alone with baby Ari at the time his injuries to his <laughs> his face and his stomach are first known. She is alone with the baby. That's critical, Kelly. That will be something ultimately up for the experts. It'll be very interesting if they have some kind of you know, therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist take the witness stand for the prosecution to show motive, to show what the reasoning was behind it. Nancy, if a fact was the fact that she goes in and does this and then in fact becomes her own hero, so to speak, that is definitely something potentially I could see the um, expert psychologist um, psychiatrists potentially testifying to, and of course the defendants will have the opportunity to cross-examine and potentially present their own experts as, as well. It appears that potentially one of their um, defenses will be that it was an accident based on what the attorney said to news reporters. Of course, she remains innocent in our jurisprudence until she is proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Please join us on our mission to find missing people, especially children, to solve unsolved homicides. If you're on the go, catch us on your favorite podcast app where you can get all of our content where we, in our own way, seek justice. 
As parents of newborns Savannah and Ethan wait in the ER with the baby Ari, they receive an even more worrying call. Baby Leon has fallen and is unresponsive. What? D their heads must have been blowing off. They're in the ER with baby Ari with genital swelling and cuts and bruises. And they get a, an email or text, I guess, from the PhD student, the GLAM PhD student, that the other baby is now unresponsive due to a head injury. Okay, who is this woman that the press insists on calling, calling a glamorous PhD student slash Spy, uh, spin cyclist instructor. Well, let's hear it from the horse's mouth. Listen. Hi there. My name is Nicole Verzi, and I'm the first author on the article titled Depression Symptom Patterns as Predictors of Metabolic Syndrome and Cardiac Events in Symptomatic Women with Suspected Myocardial Ischemia. What? Okay. She's getting her psychology PhD. Oh, by the way, that video is from the Heart and Mind Journal. I bet they're proud today. But did you hear her state, I am the first author on the, of the article, and I actually located the article and read it. My eyes were bleeding because it's way beyond um, anything we learned in law school or since. So I'm going to have to go back to Dr. Kendall Crowns, joining us, renowned chief medical examiner, chief medical examiner, Tarrant County. The way I understood her article uh, is that she is describing the effects of uh, depression or, mm, let me just say, disturbing events in one's life, emotional events such as grief or turbulence. The effect that those factors have as uh, it relates to comorbidity in a heart event of a woman. Translation, I think what she's saying is if you're depressed or you have a traumatic life event, like you lose your job or you have to move or you get a divorce or there's a death in your family, how does that affect as a comorbidity factor in heart attacks or heart events? Is that what she's saying? It does sound like that is what her article is saying, that if you've had a traumatic life event, that you are at a higher risk of having a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. The exact specific of the article, I'd have to look at it, but I, I mean, stressors in life, of course, can affect you in a numerous ways. Uh, I don't, usually heart attacks, it's coronary artery disease or coronary artery blockage, not necessarily your life events, but more your poor right. dietary habits. I think she's following up on the theory, quote, it broke my heart. So let's listen to more of Nicole Verzi in her video presentation. And you notice she says, I am the first author. When I read it, I realized there were other co-authors. I'd love to hear their input on writing this article with her. Note to self, find them. Listen to Nicole Verzi. The Wise and Wise CBD Projects, which was published as part of the Heart and Mind Special Issue on Stressors and Cardiovascular Disease in 2022. That video is from the Heart and Mind Journal. But as you see her there, she looks very different than she does in that mugshot. I want to get back to the facts at issue here. Uh, listen. While spending time watching the twin boys, Ari and Leon, Nicole Verzi tells the parents she notices odd injuries on Ari's <laughs> Looking closer, the new parents decide to take Ari to the hospital, leaving their other son, Ari's twin, Leon Katz, in the care of Nicole Verzi around 6.30 p.m. Just after 11 p.m., Ethan Katz and Savannah Robertson get a call from Nicole Verzi, telling them while she was in the kitchen getting a bottle for Leon, the baby fell from his bouncer seat and hit his head. Ethan tells her to call 911. Okay, back to our special guest joining us, Gabriella DeLuca, joining us from WPXI. Gabriella, I just want to confirm something I heard you say earlier and let you, you know, elaborate on it if possible. I'm understanding a change in the story because right there we have her stating he fell from the bouncy while she was getting a, a bottle. Okay, later I hear... She said he fell from a bassinet, which is a completely different type of baby furniture. So 
what police are telling us is that when she first made that 911 call, she said, told operators that this baby, Leon, fell from a bassinet. Then it appears when investigators get there and when she talks to them, she's saying that the baby was actually in a bouncy seat that was unfastened. Um, and that bouncy seat was about 18 inches off of the ground. And if you're familiar with most bassinets, they're much higher than that. So, yes, there's a definite change in the story from what police are telling us. Let me go to Kelly Hyman joining us, veteran trial lawyer, uh, host of What's Been a Crime in Hollywood. I want to talk to you about a Moses basket. That is reportedly the type of bassinet this baby had, along with twin brother. The same kind I had for the twins. Why did I pick the Moses basket? Moses baskets replicate the basket that Moses, baby Moses, you remember he was put in the water in a little basket made of reeds and floated down the water until the king's daughter found him and took him in to raise him, Moses, Moses basket. They don't have um, bars on the side for the baby to stick its head through. They are elevated and they are solid all the way around like a basket and usually rise up on the side like a basket. Think of Noah's Ark type basket. So if the baby were to jump, eject himself at six weeks, can't crawl, can barely even sit up. I'll have to go back on uh, Dr. Crowns about that. But this baby that can't, can't even sit up yet probably jumps out of a bassinet versus a baby bouncer, which is just 18 inches off the ground. That's even more implausible. That tells a compelling story, and I could definitely see the state who brings this case bring that up, that there is no other reasonable explanation that what happened to the baby because a person is innocent but they have to the state has to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt and that is definitely key beyond a reasonable doubt i can definitely see that coming into place the fact that there is no plausible explanation for this except for the fact that the baby was harm and that's definitely something the state will bring up and can, tells a very compelling story about these beautiful beautiful um children of course she remains innocent in our jurisprudence until she is proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt Doctors at the ER are alarmed by the cat's twins' strange injuries and suspect something more sinister is afoot. Who hurt the babies? In this case, back to you, um, I, I'm very curious about the relationship between Verzi and the parents, Gabriella DeLuca. They have been friends since at least 2021. Do we know the capacity? We know that they were good friends. They were family friends and their families were friends. And we know that she was in on a special weekend for them. It was Father's Day. It was their anniversary. They have these six week old twins. You know, most moms when they uh, are, are that, that postpartum, they only want people who are really close to them coming to visit. You know, it's an emotional time, twins, there's a lot. So based on what we are seeing, I, I it seems like they were very good friends. They were close. And we have, baby Leon back home and suddenly the parents get this call or an email, baby Leon has a head injury, he's unresponsive. Listen to what the glam PhD student says to investigators, listen. Investigators speak to Nicole Verzi and decide her story of what happened to Leon Katz doesn't match up with the severity of his injuries as he would have only fallen 18 inches from the bouncer to the floor. Prosecutors consider all the information before them and charge Nicole Verzi with homicide, aggravated assault, and endangering the welfare of children. Prosecutors also file a notice of their intent to seek the death penalty against Nicole Verzi. Ouch. And now, the babysitter, the, the friend, Nicole Verzi, seems shocked that prosecutors could seek the death penalty why is it uh, so often I see when the victim of an attack is a baby that cannot speak for itself, those cases 
are handled with sweetheart deals on voluntary manslaughter. No murder charges. Not this time, Nicole Verzi. Not this time. Nicole Verzi, who's considered innocent under our system, seemingly shocked that she could face life behind bars without parole or the death penalty. I mean, let's just think it through, Dr. John Delatory, uh, renowned psychologist joining us. Think it through. Let your mind follow these claims to their logical conclusion. I know you don't like it, but do it. She, the adult, according to the state, attacked this baby in its bassinet or bouncy chair. A six-week-old tot, an infant, leaving it with so many fractures to the head, it dies. And remember, if there are multiple fractures, how did the baby get multiple fractures? Not that just one fracture you might get from falling. Did he, what, bounce off the hard, hardwood floor, then fracture the other part of his head? if it's proven there are multiple fractures. But think about the psychopathy, Dr. Del Torre, of attacking a baby, an infant, in its bassy, and doing this to the infant. And now she's, oh, my stars. I'm going to get punished? What? You also have to keep in mind her background. She is a daughter of a very well-known and respected cardiologist that practices in Manhattan at Mount Sinai. Impeccable credentials. Think about how she was brought up, most likely in the lap of luxury. And now, <gasps> I'm going to get punished? Hit me. No, I mean, you're not wrong. I mean, so when we think about this, we have to remember that conducting these kinds of evaluations, right? And I think, and I, I honestly think an evaluation needs to happen here because it is possible that factitious disorder uh, by proxy is at play. It is certainly possible. But you talk about her, you know, her father being, you know, affluent or her father having all of these accolades. Well, she does too. I mean, she's, you know, a, a PhD candidate. She has 10 articles already published. She's been published working on it for chapter. five years. I mean, that's five how long years. it takes. That's how long it takes, though, Nancy. And, and it, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's mm -hmm. troubling then. And I think, right, as a prosecutor, you know, as a prosecutor, you don't need to prove a motive. But the jury's going to want to know a motive. The jury isn't just going to look at this. And yes, her appearance, her education, everything, all of that is going to come into play. They need to know why this happened now. Why did it? Why did it happen, Doctor John Delatory? Did you just tell me I had to take into account that she's glamorous, grew up with a silver spoon in her mouth, has accomplished almost after five years getting her PhD? Do I have to remind you that Brian Koberger, remember him? He's charged with four murders. He's a PhD student too. Um, Ted Bundy. He was in law school. He's no idiot. Alex Murdoch. He was a practicing and renowned lawyer for Pete's sake. Are you telling me I have to consider their education and their glam factor, how photogenic they are, before I look at the facts of what happened to baby Ari and what happened to baby Leon? It's more to it than just you need to uh, look at their education. All of those individuals had a history of problems. She has no history of problems at all in any way, shape, or form. So we do have to think about what exactly they it is. They do not have a history of worse. problems. Well, we do, no, Nobody we do knew Ted Bundy was a, a, a serial killer until he was finally busted. You know what I have to look at? I have to look at the facts. And the facts are plain and simple, regardless of what you say, Dr. Delatory. Dr. Melissa Merrick joining us, President CEO of Prevent Child Abuse America. What is your message today in a nutshell? My message is that unfortunately, child abuse happens everywhere, right? We need to get in front of it. We need to allow families to have high quality, affordable childcare, to learn about adequate uh, caregiving strategies, right? To have 
some of the load and the stressors that are on them to, to be lifted. The Surgeon General just said that parental stress is a public health crisis, right? We know having two babies crying and, and little and uh, we're all stressed out, we're not getting enough sleep. That's not just parents, but anyone that watches our child needs to know how to soothe them um, and, and how to be appropriate. But child abuse happens everywhere, no matter education, no matter income, um, but it is always preventable. And all of us have a role to play in preventing these crazy, crazy, sad uh, fatalities and harms to kids. Dr. Kendall Crowns, what would the child have endured after a blow to the head and brain swelling? So if he was still conscious, it would cause the brain would, from the blood would start swelling and would cause severe headache, start the child to begin to throw up and then eventually go into a coma and die. But from the injuries described with the large fracture and the brain bleed, to me, it sounds like the child was swung into a hard surface, skulls fractured, he was probably immediately unconscious. And you're right, uh, Gabriella and Dr. Crowns, it's only one skull fracture to the left side of the head, but with multiple brain bleeds. How does that happen, Dr. Crowns, from one fracture on the left side of the head, which would indicate the person was right-handed that threw him, if it was, in fact, a throw? Um, how could one fracture to the left side of the skull result in multiple bl brain bleeds? So, I mean, the skull fracture is one impact. You, you have to remember the brain itself is a, has a little bit of space inside the skull. So if the child is being shook and then slammed against the surface, the shaking itself can cause a tearing of the vessels of the brain, and then that can cause hemorrhage. So when I hear something like that, it makes me feel like there was a shaking incident followed by a slam to the ground. We wait as justice unfolds in our prayers for not only Leon's, baby Leon's parents, but for baby Ari, who will grow up knowing that he once had a twin brother. We remember American hero Sergeant Stephen Robin, Bay St. Louis PD, Mississippi. Robin shot and killed in the line of duty, survived by grieving wife Amy and their children sentenced to life without dad. American hero, Sergeant Stephen Robin. Thank you to our guests for being with us to enlighten and report on this very upsetting case. But I thank you especially and to our MSM family for being with us tonight and every night. Nancy Gray signing off. I'll see you tomorrow night, 6 to 9 o'clock sharp Eastern, and until then, good night, friend. Please join us on our mission to find missing people, especially children, to solve unsolved homicides. If you're on the go, catch us on your favorite podcast app where you can get all of our content, where we, in our own way, seek justice.